Okay, good. And I wanted a little bit of applause. Now we can go back to the science. Um, what, I, what, it really, what I really want to spend in the last few minutes is telling you is how it's changed our picture of the future in science and the picture of the universe. It has changed our picture of the future completely. And I'm going to, ru I'm going to rush through this, so let me give you the short answer first. This, Kurt Vonnegut is claimed as having said this at a private girls' school when he gave a commencement address. I've given two commencement addresses, and I've never had the guts to say it, but I'd love to. He said, things are going to get unimaginably worse, and they're never, ever going to get better again. <laughs> this was before the Bush administration, too, in fact. But, <laughs> but, uh, the, uh, the, uh, but that's, our, that's our understanding of the universe. I want to tell you about it briefly. I want to tell you about a few things that you'll hear about, and some of the things that creationists and intelligent design people promote as arguing somehow that there's design in the universe. This is one of them, and I want to explain to you why it has nothing to do with design. It is weird and strange that we live in a universe that looks like we do, because this is a brief history of time. This is the density of matter as the universe expands. It goes down as one over the volume. But it turns out the energy density of empty space remains constant as the universe expands. And we live today, right here, when the energy density of empty space is three times bigger than the energy density of matter. But the, when you look at this, this has driven physicists crazy. Because this is the only time in the history of the universe when these two numbers are about the same. At all earlier times, the density of matter was much greater. At all later times, the density of empty space will be much greater. Why do we live at this special time in the history of the universe? Well, the answer that one of the answers that's been given is that these things exist, galaxies. Why? Well, let's go back to this picture and let's pretend the energy of empty space were 50 times bigger. Then these two curves would cross, not now, but then. Well, when is then in this case? Then is the time when galaxies first formed. But if the energy of empty space was bigger than the energy density of matter when galaxies first formed, then the repulsive force would be greater than the attractive force. Galaxies would never have formed. Well, if galaxies never formed, then maybe this is telling us something. And this has produced something that I call anthropic mania. If there are many different universes, people at physicists have argued, and the energy of empty space can vary in each one, then only in those in which it's not much greater than what we measure today will galaxies form. Okay? But then, only then will stars and planets form, and only then will astronomers form. <laughs> so the universe is the way it is because astronomers are here to measure it. <laughs> now, it not only sounds ridiculous, but it also sounds religious. And some people have said the universe is fine-tuned. If it were any different, then we wouldn't be here. God clearly created the universe to be for us. Now, that's nonsense. And it's nonsense for the same reason that you learned so beautifully in Richard's books. Why can bees tell the colors of flowers so they can find them? Not because God intended them to do it, but if they, did, if they couldn't find the flowers, they wouldn't get the stuff they needed to eat, and they wouldn't be around. It's natural selection. And what Riss is really telling us is kind of a cosmic natural selection. Because all it's saying, if it's true, is that it's not too surprising that we find ourselves li living in a universe that allows life. Because of the universes that don't allow life, we wouldn't be here. It's just that simple. So if you wish, it's a kind of cosmic evolution. Or cosmic natural selection is a better way of thinking about it. Now, as pretty as that is, I think it's wrong. It's ugly. And it goes against everything I think about and I know about science. Science has told us the last 400 years why the universe is, must be the way it is, not why it has to be something different. In fact, Einstein once asked a question. He said it the wrong way. Put it here because... He, well, I wanted to quote him. He said, what really interests me is whether God, and by God he didn't mean God, had any choice in the creation of the universe. What he really meant is, are the laws of physics fixed so that if you changed one parameter, the whole, you couldn't have a universe? Or can you have infinite numbers of different laws of physics that all work, and, and it just happens to be the way it is? If this anthropic picture is right, then physics is really an environmental science. We're, there's no fundamental laws necessarily, we're just here by an accident. And the laws of physics are the way they are, not because there's some beautiful mathematical theory that tells us they have to be, just because if they were different, we wouldn't be here. 
Now that, I, found, I find repugnant, although it may be true. And I was going to spend time telling you about that, but I'm really behind, so maybe I shouldn't. Um, th there, let me just say that there is a theory that, that suggests, I mean, in such a picture, if there are an infinite number of universes, then you don't need a theory of everything. Forget what I wrote there. You need a theory of anything. You just need an infinite number of universes and some theory that tells you anything can happen. We have such a theory, and I did want to spend one minute telling you about it. It's called string theory. Here's the, here's the brief summary of it. One person said to another, I just had an awesome idea. Suppose all matter and energy is made of tiny vibrating strings. The second guy says, okay, what would that imply? And the first guy says, I don't know. <laughs> so that's, that's a history of string theory in the last 25 years. And the point is, it, it, it is fascinating for many people, but one of the things it might predict is that anything is possible. And if anything is possible, it's not clear you have a scientific theory at all. But now, I'm going to skip forward. In the last minute, I, I had a good arc, joke about George Bush, but I won't give it. <laughs> and I'm going to skip this. I'm going to skip this. Forgive me, it's really interesting, but I want to get to the very end, which will really tell you about how miserable our future really is. And it should put us, give us a kind of cosmic humility, which is the other thing that is, I should be characteristic of science. A humility, the recognition that we don't understand everything. Bill Maher talked about it last night. What pompous assholes like Rick Warren, who claim to understand everything, are an anathema to science. We should realize that, that where there's more we don't understand about the universe than we do. And I want to give you an example of this. The far future. What's going to happen in the far future? Remember, a hundred years ago, we thought we lived in a static, eternal universe. What will the future bring? The amazing thing is, for civilizations that live in the far future, what will they see? Well, the universe is accelerating. That means all the distant galaxies are getting carried away from us, and eventually they'll move away from us faster than the speed of light. It's allowed in general relativity. They will disappear. The longer we wait, the less we will see. In a hundred billion years, any observers evolving on stars around our, uh, and, and there will be stars just like our sun in a hundred billion years, any observers on civilizations evolving around those stars will see nothing except for our galaxy, which is exactly the picture they had in 1915. All evidence of the Hubble expansion will disappear. Why? Because we won't see the other galaxies moving apart from us. So they will have no evidence, in fact, of the Big Bang. They won't see the Hubble expansion, they won't even know about dark energy, and I won't go into that. They won't know about the cosmic microwave background. It will disappear too. It will redshift away, and it turns out, for fancy reasons, there's a plasma in our galaxy, and, and, uh, and when the universe is 50 times its present age, the microwave background won't be able to propagate in our galaxy. All evidence of the Big Bang will have disappeared. And those scientists will discover quantum mechanics, discover relativity, discover evolution, discover all the basic principles of science that we understand today, use the best observations they can do with the best telescopes they will build, and they will derive a picture of the universe which is completely wrong. They will derive a picture of the universe as being one galaxy surrounded by empty space that's static and eternal. Falsifiable science will produce the wrong answer. In fact, I want to end with the good news. We live in a very special time. The only time we can observationally verify that we live in a very special time. <laughs> okay, it's clear I'm, I'm clear I'm being facetious. What it really should tell us is we've discovered this crazy picture of the universe that we don't understand at all. It all holds together. But maybe if we had evolved five billion years earlier, there would have been observables we could have seen that would have changed that picture. Maybe five billion years in the future, it'll be different. The universe remains mysterious. And that is great. But I do want to say, in the far future, this is the picture. We will be lonely and ignorant, but dominant. And those of us who live in the United States are, are used to that. <laughs> let, me, let me end. Okay, that's the end. Thank you.